This is the Nagakin Capsule Tower. It was the first large building to be made out of capsules, little pre-made capsules. This radical idea promised efficiency during construction, flexibility over time, and it offers an affordable urban dwelling for a person seeking a minimal or transient lifestyle. But this building was built over 50 years ago, long before any tiny living had a hashtag, and the tower had a long and tumultuous life in those years. Hundreds, maybe thousands of people called it home, and unfortunately, this experiment in urban capsule life recently culminated in its bittersweet end when it was dismantled just last year. From its birth, life, and eventual demise, we've been able to learn all sorts of valuable lessons about living small and modular prefabricated construction. While the dream is full of promise, the challenges of its reality are telling for how it reveals the limits and actual desires for permanence and adaptability from the spaces that we live in. The Nakaken Capsule Tower was built in 1972 in Tokyo, Japan, and designed by the architect Kisho Kurakawa. The 38-year-old was part of an architectural movement called the Metabolists, which began 12 years earlier in 1960. These architects, who were like Kurakawa, Kenzo Tange, Fumiko Maki, and others, would meet late at night after work. They were driven to reimagine how our buildings and cities could be radically reconceived after World War II. This period was marked by rapid growth of the population and the economy. The metabolists, during their late night conversations, spoke about solving these challenges by redeploying the enormous technological and logistical advancements that were developed during the war. Armies and countries across the globe had proven that mass production, coupled with transportation infrastructure, are the keys to solving seemingly insurmountable challenges. How could these be leveraged to solve non-wartime problems? And how might they allow us to think about the way that we make our buildings and cities, and how might our lives change as a result? The main conceit is that we should treat the city and buildings like a gigantic living and growing entity. We can make things and move them around like a biological body does through its circulatory system, for instance. Then the city would live, grow, and adapt in efficient ways, all modeled on biological systems. That's why they call themselves the metabolists, and their work took on branched forms like veins and arteries, with cleared hierarchies between the permanent and the efficiently organized infrastructure, and the increasingly smaller scale and individuating spaces. The process of differentiation continued all the way down, finally to the scale of a single housing unit. And so capsules were considered the individual unit of life, equivalent to the role of a cell in a body. A cell has a single purpose, and the capsule within the metabolist principles did too. The capsule was the minimum form of dwelling for a minimum lifestyle. Either way, cells live and die as the body or the city evolves, and then these cells are serviced by more permanent and lasting arteries or avenues of flow. Metabolism became the first widely exported global architectural movement that originated from Asia when an entire world's exposition was dedicated to demonstrating and spreading its principles. And this was held in Osaka 10 years after those late night chats began. The event gave the exposure and credibility to Kurokawa to pursue these concepts in their first permanent large scale application for a housing tower in Tokyo. The tower is conceived around three primary elements. First is the base for the building to meet the city with collective amenities and spaces for gathering people before they enter the second element, which is one of the two concrete cores. These are for everything that's vertical, like stairs, elevators, pipes and electrical conduits and things like that. And they also provide structural support for the third element, the 140 separate capsules that attach to the concrete cores and then cantilevered from it. The idea was that the cores and the base would be relatively permanent, as their functions don't really change over time. But the capsules would be pre-manufactured off-site and then easily lifted into place with a crane. They would be easily attached and demountable over time. In fact, they were only attached using four bolts for each capsule. That's it. But for over 50 years, not a single bolt failed. Even though the bolts were durable, Kurokawa understood that at the scale of an individual unit, things needed to change and be repaired more frequently. The thought was that this refresh would happen about every 20 or 30 years or so. The capsules were built out of welded steel trusses at a nearby shipyard and constructed using techniques that were common to products like cars or airplanes, but maybe less common for architecture. While much of the thought behind the construction of the building was forward-looking like this, ultimately the construction of the unit itself used a lot of traditional materials and techniques. For instance, everything on the interior was made of wood, not plastic or metal or other kinds of surfaces that you might find in, say, like an airplane. The capsule units were built to be self-supporting. This was so that they could survive the ordeal of moving them all around. 
This rigidity was also important for them in their ultimate home because they actually cantilevered off of the concrete cores. They're not supported at their ends and they don't physically touch any of the other units below or above or to their sides. The size of the capsule was ultimately determined by its ability to be transported on highway roads from the factory and into the site. So its mobility was always a huge factor at every level of its design. And this is keeping with the metabolist ideals of a dynamic and a living building. Each capsule is only about 100 square feet and consisted of a bathroom and then a series of built-in functional furniture units, an overhead console unit, an AC and closet unit, the fold-out desk, and then the bed in the storage area. Given the tiny quarters, it was important that each element be multifunctional. For instance, the space underneath the bed held drawers for storage. 140 of these units were attached to one of the two towers, a process which only took four months to do. The speed and the ease of this process was meant to ensure that it would be changing over time. The kind of lifestyle that these capsules support is of course not for everyone. Its designers knew that, and it wasn't a proposal for how everyone should live in the future. But it was an experiment, and Kurokawa thought it might be a great for a business person looking for a place to stay in the city for short periods of time. But like many utopian projects, the world didn't work out exactly as original dreamers had envisioned. Firstly, and probably most importantly, the building was not maintained the way that it was originally intended. Kurokawa says of the design that it was recyclable. I designed it as sustainable architecture. The replacement of the capsules would take three and a half to four months for each of the buildings of the two towers. With completely new capsules, it would last another hundred years. That's how I think it should work. But unfortunately, with 140 residents, ownership of the building is divided among them. So replacing an entire capsule was much more difficult than was anticipated. In fact, not a single capsule was ever replaced in the entire 50 years of the building's life. This was in part due to the fact that it required a few capsules to come down in order to get to any single one. It wasn't possible to do just one at a time. And getting that many apartment renters to agree to such an inconvenience just wasn't in the cards. But since this was how it was designed to work, the lack of any replacement of the capsules for those 50 years presented a cascade of unsolvable challenges, and uniquely all sides of the outside of the capsule were actually exposed to the elements, but you couldn't actually get in between them to make any repairs. So the metal exterior panels started to rust away and leaked until it was impossible to keep the water out of any of the units. And then during the final years, they even put a net around the entire building to save people from falling debris. While it was a challenge to keep water from coming into your unit from outside, eventually getting water in to take a shower was impossible too. All the pipes in the concrete core towers had burst and were unrepairable. So a secondary system of cold water was threaded through the building and pierced inelegantly into the hallways. If you lived in the tower and needed to take a shower, you had to sign up for one of the communal showers down on the first floor. And pipes weren't the only thing hanging out in the hallways. People used it for extra storage too, since it wasn't just a place for on-the-go business people. So people adapted the units over time to accommodate their individual lifestyles. Throughout this video, you've been seeing interior photographs of the capsules taken by Noritaka Minami, who spent 12 years documenting the lives of dozens of the units. There's an exhibition of this work at the Moss Context Reading Room here in Chicago. When people think that it is not a successful living space, it's based on this idea that it's supposed to fit normal conventional requirements of like say a single unit or studio space when it's it wouldn't when it was never was so once you understand that then it allows for a resident to successfully use the space understanding what it is it's really interesting how each person ends up interpreting interpreting how to use that space so that it becomes uh, livable for their own needs the entire building was eventually devalued to the point that an American hedge fund firm was able to purchase it and demolish it. This required 80% of the inhabitants to agree that this is the best outcome, and it was really the only conceivable outcome. The building wasn't old enough to qualify for historic preservation, and the site could accommodate a much more intensive use, making redevelopment a foregone conclusion. So in 2021, the process began of dismounting the units from the cores. Ironically, since this was the first time that a capsule had ever been removed, it actually proved just how easy they were to take down. But alas, it was too late to just make any practical use of this. A little over 30 capsules were actually saved for preservation, eventually to be sent around the world to museums to be able to exhibit. Preservation is being overseen by Kurokawa's practice, using the original specifications and blueprints, but the architect himself has since passed. The units that weren't slated for preservation only took about 30 minutes to smash with a bulldozer. 
Luckily, prior to demolition, Japanese digital consultancy Gluon recorded 20,000 photographs and a complete laser scan to create an augmented reality model of the building. So the building will be preserved both digitally to visit virtually and physically, albeit distributed around the globe. Maybe in the near future, you'll be able to experience a capsule at a local museum. The building promised to live and grow physically like a biological being, but that didn't really happen. Instead, the lessons live on in a more dispersed ways, even beyond the physical and digital distribution of its original elements. Today, you can stay in Kurokawa's house, which was built in 1973, just after the capsule tower, and it's actually made from the exact same kind of capsule as the tower, though not all of them are configured with the same furniture units. But even beyond this direct afterlife, the ideas from the metabolists carry forward as well. Today, towers made of pre-manufactured components is a popular subject of research and experimentation. The Nagakin capsule tower should have been able to last almost forever with regular maintenance and replacement. While the original dreams were never fulfilled, I applaud the effort. This was a real commitment to something new, a new way of building buildings, and a new way of living. Neither was quite destined to take off and become the future that we live in now, but I'm sure glad that they tried. This video was made possible by Brilliant. All this talk about branching fractal structures and metabolist architecture, it got me thinking about the geometry lessons that I recently explored over on Brilliant. The course was called Beautiful Geometric Explorations, and it began with an investigation on infinite areas. I learned all about figures with infinite numbers of pieces, just like a metabolist utopia might be. The parallels are almost uncanny, and the direct application of Brilliant's courses to my areas of interest is why it's my go-to for engaging edutainment on all STEM subjects. With Brilliant's hands-on approach, you'll learn by doing, and there's a community of like-minded learners there to help keep you engaged. The courses have storytelling, interactive challenges, and problems to solve, and they have all kinds of STEM subjects to choose from. Maybe you want to learn about computer science or math. Brilliant has something for everyone. And look, I am not a puzzler at all, but wrapping it all in such an engaging package has me coming back on my computer or on my phone all throughout the day. You got a free moment? Pop back in and learn a little bit more. And you can too while getting 20% off of your annual premium subscription if you're one of the first 200 people to go to brilliant.org slash Stuart Hicks to sign up today. If you enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a like, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. You'll be rewarded with videos on the built environment dropping every other Thursday. While you're waiting for the next one, check out some of these other ones. See you over there.